Hey folks, it's Andrew from Gemba Red, and today we'll be debunking a myth that near-infrared is not heat, and that red light is actually hotter than near-infrared. I have some ideas about where this myth might have come from, because I think that's important to address the root cause of where this came from, because I think a lot of people will have anchoring bias that uh, they won't want to believe all this, but we'll be covering a lot of uh, science to prove that it's true. So I assume somewhere along our education, we were taught that the word infrared is synonymous with heat, uh, which again, you know, the word infrared is just representing certain wavelengths, and it's more important to consider the absorption and reflection properties of how it interacts with specific types of matter. So it doesn't always necessarily become heat. And of course, a lot of people are feeling heat from their high intensity LED devices, and then they falsely attribute it to the near infrared. And so that means we know that heat is not just a function of wavelength, which we'll be talking about, but it's also a function of intensity, energy, and coverage area. Like if you have a tiny laser pointer that's emitting 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared, that's a lot less heat than a panel covering a large area that's uh, emitting, you know, 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So it's a big difference in area. And it, of course, you know, if you have a high intensity laser of any wavelength, then you'll be burning stuff, right? So it's also a function of intensity, energy, and cover coverage area, which we won't be talking about. We're going to assume all these other factors are constant, and we're just talking about the wavelength right now. And of course, we cannot visibly see near infrared, so we need to assign it some other physical quantities. So people kind of say, okay, well, you can't see it, but maybe you can feel it as heat. And again, generally, that might be true depending on the intensity. And some of the original physicists and doctors that looked at this, like Niels Finson and William Herschel, they also labeled infrared as this kind of heating wavelength because they had no other attribute to assign it to, like they assigned uh, ultraviolet as the chemical rays, because uh, those had the most photochemical reactions, but they found that the reds and the near infrareds didn't have much chemical reactivity, uh, but they could still measure it on a thermometer. But anyway, let me know in the comments where you think this myth might have come from. So let's jump right into it. For me, the real concrete evidence comes from the safety standards for intensity on the skin. Uh, depending on the wavelength, they have different standards for how much intensity is safe for the skin before you cause too much heating or can cause burns. So one study referenced ANSI guidelines, and they said you need to be below 200 milliwatts per centimeter squared for 635 nanometers red, and you need to be below 400 milliwatts per centimeter squared for 808 near infrared. And so that's a huge difference. That means that skin can tolerate twice as much intensity of near infrared compared to red without burning. So in other words, red at 635 nanometers is twice as much heating than near infrared. So we can tolerate much higher intensities of near infrared in the 808 wavelength than we can 635. So the standards have known about this for a very long time. And here's another photobiomodulation study also referencing some standards uh, that you want to stay below to uh, reduce unacceptable heating. So they give the range between 800 and 900 nanometers. You want to be below 750 milliwatts per centimeter squared. For the range 600 to 700 nanometers, you want to be below 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And for the blue range, if between 400 and 500 nanometers, you want to be below 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So again, according to this standard, red is two and a half times more heating than the near infrared range between 800 and 900 nanometers. This is important scope uh, that I didn't mention in the beginning. I'm mostly talking about the near infrared wavelengths that are most common in red light therapy devices between 800 and 900 nanometers. And we'll also be talking about uh, 1050 up until 1120 nanometers, those common wavelengths. In the 900s, there is a peak of water absorption that does cause a lot more heating. So we're gonna ignore the 900s, uh, but we're mostly talking about the low 800s and the high uh, 1000s, uh, you know, 1060, 1070, 1080 ish. And what's also another myth uh, that might be shocking to people is that they're saying blue light causes a lot of heat. You want to stay below 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared to not cause too much heating. That means blue light is about three times more heating than red, and it's about seven and a half times more heating than near infrared. So again, it comes down to absorption. Blue light is very well absorbed by melanin, and it's also absorbed well by the hemoglobin and blood in, in our skin. So one study did directly compare a couple different wavelengths, 980, 1064, 
650 and 810 and they tried to see which one caused the most heating and the the least heating and also at the top here i also showed they they cite the same exact uh standards as as before of, of what what the limits are for uh laser intensity so you don't uh burn yourself and they write it out in mathematical terms, which is fun for me, uh, but they're basically saying 980 nanometers had the most heating, uh, then 1064 had less heating than 980, and then that was roughly equal to 650 red, so 1064 and 650 red had roughly the same heating, and 810 had the least heating by a pretty wide margin. And it may be important to note that this was on isolated tissue. It wasn't on living tissue or on a whole being. Uh, and we know there might be some problems with that because obviously it doesn't have any active thermoregulation like we do have with our own skin. We're trying to thermoregulate. So if we have too much intensity, that's why, uh, you know, our body tries to thermoregulate. It sends more blood to the skin and tries to shuttle that away uh, and then we get less penetration because we have more blood flow in the area but with dead tissue you don't have those mechanisms and also they might be just lacking in blood and water in general so it might not be a good representation of a whole living being but it is a good start and a couple of years ago i did some experiments with some high intensity uh, led panels that i had custom made with a single wavelengths uh, so i compared 630 nanometers 660 810 and 850 and i had them uh, aimed at my arm and i was measuring the temperature change over time now you can see I tried to keep the intensities pretty constant, but sometimes that's hard. It was around 55 uh, to 60 milliwatts per centimeter squared for each wavelength. But it was very clear that the 630 and 660, the red wavelengths caused the most heating to my arms. It caused the most rapid increase in temperature. And the 810 and 850 had obviously the least heating on my skin. And so a little bit of the physics is that Obviously, the photons need to be absorbed in order to cause heating. If they're being reflected from the skin, then obviously they cannot cause heat. And so here's a recent study that measured living human skin and what was the reflection spectrum for both fair skin and for black skin. And we can see very clearly we have about 60% reflection from 600 nanometers all the way up to 1120 nanometers for light skin. Uh, so again, the highest reflection range corresponds to the lowest heating and for black skin we can kind of divide it up it's between 10 or 30 percent reflection from 600 to 700 nanometers so for the, for the red light on black skin it's going to be highly absorbed by the melanin so that's going to cause a lot more heating uh, so you want to be mindful of the red lights particularly uh, for darker skin types that that's going to cause a lot more heat and we have about 45 to 55 percent reflection uh, for the 800 to 1120 nanometer range for the black skin. So again, very high reflection, similar reflection losses of 45 to 55% with darker skin types in the uh, near infrared range. So again, confirming that the near infrared range would be the least heating. And we can think about the converse of this. We can talk about the absorption characteristics, but we know below 600 nanometers, you get more absorption from hemoglobin and from melanin. And so that's why you get more heat from reds, yellows, greens, and blues, and UVs. You get more heat from those wavelengths compared to near infrared because they have higher absorption from hemoglobin and from melanin. And of course, most people know that the longer wavelength infrareds, once we go above 1120 nanometers, that's where water absorption starts to significantly pick up. And that's why you start to feel more heating from longer wavelength near infrared, mid infrared, far infrared so a lot of people are correct you feel a lot of heat from superficial water absorption uh, even from relatively low intensities of far infrared mid infrared and wavelengths of near infrared beyond 11 20 nanometers so the other physical characteristic we can think about is how the light is penetrating into the skin we know that near infrared penetrates about twice as much as red and so that gives near infrared much more volume for the energy and for the intensity to disperse and to spread out and release that heat over a wider area. And then that allows the blood and conduction mechanisms to thermoregulate so you get less heat from near infrared. 
And with red, that's much more superficially absorbed. And again, all those other wavelengths are also more su superficially absorbed. So any wavelengths that are superficially absorbed, that absorption will be concentrated in the first couple millimeters of the skin. And that's why you feel much more concentrated energy absorption. And that's what leads to much more dramatic heating. And of course, there is one safety consideration that if you are working with high intensity near infrared, that energy will reach deeper tissues that are much more sensitive to heat, like our brains and our sensitive organs. Uh, so if you are working with high intensity near infrared, you have to think about the amount of energy that's getting deposited into those more sensitive tissues. The skin is pretty resilient to heat. That's one caveat of near infrared heating you have to consider. It is delivering that energy much deeper. So if you get too much energy to those deeper tissues that are very sensitive, like the brains and the organs, uh, then that could be a heating problem. So again, that's kind of a niche consideration, but uh, I think it'll be important in the future. And I'm just giving an example here. I have two tanks of water. If I heat them up, if you put them on your stove top at high heat, which one heats up the fastest? The one with less volume, right? So the least the volume you have, the faster it'll heat up. If you have more volume of water, it takes longer to heat up. The same thing with near infrared. It's being distributed amongst a larger volume of tissue and water, and we have these thermoregulation mechanisms that can cope with it easier. And so what are the practical implications? I think if people keep ignoring this issue and keep perpetuating this myth, you know, it could become uh, very problematic and maybe it already has. So if you want to avoid heat, particularly from high intensity red light therapy, you want to prefer uh, the 800s, 800 to 900 and 1050 up into 1120 wavelengths. And those are going to be the least heating wavelengths on the entire sunlight spectrum. If you're feeling a lot of heat from a device, you could experiment with reducing the intensity of the red. And if it has blue and green and yellow, those are also very heating. Uh, so you want to reduce the intensity of red light if you actually want to reduce heating. So a lot of people uh, seem to be doing the opposite, uh, which again does work because you're cutting the intensity in half. So again, it's a function of intensity, um, but it's the red that could be causing most of your heating issues. And manufacturers should start to consider if they're going to keep pumping out high intensity LED panels, you would want to prefer a higher ratio of near infrared to red to reduce the heating. So like the standard has been 50-50 red to near infrared, maybe you want only 25% red to near infrared. And so that would be a better proportion. So really reduce uh, what you're offering for uh, the red ratio and have much higher in the near infrared that could reduce the heating. And if, it, if people really want high intensities without scorching themselves, then you would start to prefer much more near infrared in your devices. And so that's why when I reviewed the Shenzhen Idea Light RL Pro 300, uh, I thought the ratio could be a pretty good idea of having much higher near infrared to red. So you can have high intensities with less heating. So anyway, that's my bit for today. Hopefully this clears some confusion and uh, people can stop perpetuating the myth that near infrared is just heat. Thanks for tuning in.